Hello, and welcome to Gemini Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, digital media editor at Gemini Network Open. Of course, if you're following along live, please uh, send us your questions or comments on Twitter at Gemini Network Open or in the comment box in YouTube or Facebook Live. Today, we are talking about U.S. adults' preferences for public allocation of vaccine for COVID-19. We've got first author, Dr. Sarah Gullist with us. Welcome. Hi, thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. Very, really glad you could join us. Um, we've known each other on Twitter for a bit, so this is always fun. Um, so if you could start out, just tell us a bit about who you are, what you do, why you did the study. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health in the Division of Health Policy and Management. And I study public opinion really writ large. I'm really interested in how the public understands health policy issues and particularly what's the role of communication, uh, media communication in particular in shaping how the public understands the world as it relates to health policy and particularly um, politically charged health policy issues, which we have a lot of these days. Um, I also teach uh, courses in public health ethics, and it was really the intersection of my teaching in public health ethics and my work on public opinion that brought me to this study. Great. Um, so one of the things I love about the study is it's really straightforward, so I can, uh, <laughs> yes, I, it is. I can describe it, uh, and I mean in a very good way. Um, I can describe it, I think, very quickly. In, in late April 2020, you did a survey of about 1,000 respondents asking them, you know, if there's going to be a vaccine, there's a chance there won't be abundant supplies. There'll be some level of scarcity, so we might need some guidelines to kind of prioritize different groups. So how would this kind of lay public audience prioritize eight different groups? Does that sound about right? Exactly right. Okay, so tell us what you found. Yeah, so um, those eight groups were divided by um, uh, essentially risk of severe consequences, mortality from COVID-19, um, age, and then employment status. And so we asked people about these eight groups, which of these groups do you think public health authorities should signal should get the vaccine at high priority, medium priority, or low priority? Um, and sort of the main finding was that a whopping majority, so um, 90, almost 92% of respondents to the study said that frontline medical workers should get high priority access to a potential future a coronavirus vaccine. And as a public opinion researcher, we can rarely see 92% of the public agreeing on anything. Um, so that was really a, a key finding that suggests that the public would be in support of guidelines that provide first access to those frontline medical workers. Um, the next highest group uh, that people were comfortable prioritizing high access to vaccine were, were people um, at severe risk of, again, bad outcomes or um, mortality from COVID-19, particularly older adults over 65 and kids with sort of everyday uh, adults um, age 18 to 64 coming uh, right behind that. So the key criteria the public seemed to be using and making these judgments were medical worker status and risk of bad outcomes from COVID-19. Yeah, so again, I agree. I was kind of uh, shocked and impressed that we could get 92% of people to agree on anything. Um, yep. Obviously, I think it's the correct answer as a frontline health worker. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm clearly biased, but it also makes sense. If there's a, an infectious pandemic, you need people who work in hospitals and such to be able to take care of people. So it's, yep. it's somewhat logical. You know, that's where we focus PP early on. I think um, also some, something about these results that kind of resonated a bit with me is this is stuff that had kind of been in the ether around the time with things about where does PPE go, who should be able to go to work, just how to prioritize kind of everything. So um, I don't know. How did that strike you? Yeah, no, um, definitely um, it's consistent with past recommendations in allocating scarce um, flu vaccines, such as in H1N1 in 2009. And what I think is most reassuring is that it's completely consistent with some of the emergent guidance, emergent guidance that's coming out um, even just last week from the National Academies. Um, they issued a framework for recommendations that also prioritized in that very first phase of delivery of vaccine frontline medical workers and people at the highest risk of mortality. Um, and so seeing that the public, at least back in April, is aligned with some of these expert groups that are now tasked with making these recommendations um, was really uh, heartening for me to see as a survey researcher. Yeah, that's, so it's always nice to see that kind of concordance, I think. Um, so, and uh, the figure I think is really nice. I love nice, elegant figures, and it kind of graphically shows uh, where the priorities are, are put. And I think one of the things that struck me is how close some of the numbers are on these. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And just there, there's not a lot of difference between a lot of the groups. Of course, you get the problem of if everybody's a high priority or very close to it, then 
nobody's high priority. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm curious, as you know, you you spend a lot more time uh, doing work in this area than I do. Uh, what uh, anything surprised you about these results? Yeah, I mean, I think you raise a good point, which is that um, in the way we designed the question, we didn't really constrain them from saying everyone should get access. And in fact, almost one in five or 18 percent of our respondents said each of the eight groups should get high priority. So in some ways, that's a bit of a flaw of the survey design, right? We didn't force those choices. But on the other hand, it's also illuminating of what could be a potential source of resistance down the road. Right. So if if there's, you know, 20 percent of people who are these egalitarians who want everyone to get access at the same time, that also suggests they might resist very necessary um, rationing or all allocation based on scarcity. And so that's another finding, I think, to keep in mind. Um, I, you know, I, I was pleased to see uh, that the public was able to make these distinctions based on on risk, um, that those at higher risk would get higher priority um, than those at lower risk. Um, so again, those were all those were all like reassuring findings. I was also surprised that there weren't a huge number of differences, demographic differences, in how the public, at least back in April, was making these judgments. Yeah, I'm curious if, if uh, these sort of attitudes will change as we get closer and closer to the wire where it becomes more real. I mean, pretty soon we're hopefully going to be in a situation where we actually have to, uh, this isn't in the abstract. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I have I, a lot of thoughts about that. I mean, I'm certainly um, the discourse on vaccine has changed yeah. a lot since April. So in April, there was still um, the process of vaccine approvals and the research around vaccines hadn't yet been as politicized as we're seeing it to be now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in this in this point, you know, 100 years ago in April, people's sentiments towards vaccines may have been more hopeful and that may have led to what we see to be sort of a, a more rational way of, of judging and thinking among the public. And so um, now when questions about vaccine production, approval and what might happen, um, are a bit more tied up with the politics of the day. Um, I'm not sure whether we would see these results replicate. Yeah, and it's um, it's it's. I mean, I've this isn't a topic I follow incredibly closely, but just watching you know basic news headlines. I mean, just right even the last couple of days, there's been some news where the White House seems to be pressuring the FDA to uh, I yeah. don't know have looser guidelines as far as or loose looser requirements on how much follow was needed. With basically the implication being there should be the possibility to approve a vaccine before the election which is yep. probably not possible to what the FDA scientists wanted. Um, right. Yeah, so that's yeah. fun. Um, yeah, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. And I think the other side of the coin is that we were in the survey question, again, one single item, um, presuming there would be vaccine scarcity because demand would exceed the supply. Right. Um, however, if um, people continue to be hesitant about a vaccine, that may not be the, the case at all. We might be actually convincing people uh, more persuasively that they need to line up and get vaccine rather than the premise of this study was right. that there would be a, a severe shortage, um, yeah. at uh, least at first. Yeah. And unfortunately, as uh, usually I'm a, an optimistic cynic, but at this point, I'm actually just plain cynical, where unfortunately, I think those are going to be two concurrent problems and not... Yeah. Uh, not solutions to each other. Yeah, um, no, I think that's exactly right. <laughs> I mean, but that being said, I'm, I'm, I think I'm hopeful that one of the vaccines at least will work well, and that'll be better than no vaccines, and we'll have these problems to argue about yes. rather than uh, than no vaccines. I think. Yes, uh, I agree I with you. Uh, yeah. Uh, we've got a couple of viewers, Carlos Segundo and Abdo Salama, who joined. Welcome. We're talking about um, uh, uh, who to prioritize if, in public allocation of a vaccine for COVID-19. Um, again, just just looking at these numbers, they're all pretty close, so it's hard to mince too much about it. I'm a, you know okay. a little surprised that the um, pregnant women were a little lower priority than some of the other groups, um, and also that essential workers who aren't healthcare workers were kind of basically about the same as high risk uh, middle aged adults. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we're, we're parsing pretty small numbers and, and who yes, knows, uh, small numbers. And I think that without that signal of that, they're at high risk, um, they just fell lower, lower in yeah. the priority among the public. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. So interesting stuff. Um, I'm trying to, yeah. I mean, I think that brings us about to the end of our time here. Anything else you wanted to say on the topic? Um, no, I mean, I, I think that the um, key issues moving forward will be really um, thinking more carefully about how to engage the public. 
uh, you know, I'm the first to say that a single survey is not public engagement in any meaningful way. So thinking about really engaging communities who are at high risk, mm -hmm. who are vulnerable to this awful disease, and thinking through um, proactively how to get support for what's going to be tough decisions down the road. We want this very badly, right? We want this problem to have, of having a, a vaccine available, um, but I think we need to be really careful, um, you know, evidence-based communication, community engagement are the paths to get us there. Great. Yeah. Absolutely. Very well put. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. This is a really great paper. Um, the, yeah. Please, uh, you, any, any of our viewers, you can get this paper online. It's uh, free and open access at jamanetworkopen.com. We've got new papers coming out every weekday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And join us again next week, Tuesday, I believe that's October 13th, at 3 p.m. Central Time again for another episode of Jana Live. So stay safe and take care. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.